Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk. We are here to share our experiences on how we reduced the DevOps toil on eliminating the patching and up, uh, upgrading toil uh, with Cluster Autoscaler. So I'm Sheikh Israel, and I go by Israel. Um, I've been with Oracle for the last three years, and I'm I'm just starting out in the Kubernetes world, and I've, I'm, I'm actually really loving it. So I'm a Kubernetes enthusiast, and I actually am very passionate about solving distributed system problems. I am really enjoying this. This is my first conference, by the way, and I'm very excited to be here, to be on so many talks and meet so many people here. So thank you, KubeCon, for arranging this. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, my name is John Moore. Most people call me JMO. Uh, I am an SRE by trade, uh, probably got somewhere close to 20 years now in the industry. Um, started off in networking and stumbled my way through programming. Eventually got to um, basically data stores. I don't know what it is about them, but I fell in love with them. Uh, loved MongoDB. I don't know what it was about it, but document databases really turned the, turned the page for me. Um, before I knew it, I started playing around with Kubernetes, and honestly, I'm never going to look back. So. First of all, a little bit about us and kind of where, why we're here. Um, Israel and I, we work in OCI, that's the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, we operate the service known as OSS, which is the Oracle Streaming Service. So much like Kinesis and AWS, um, we offer a fully scalable streaming environment that customers can use for all of their data in motion and real-time use cases. Behind the scenes, it's incre incredibly run on top of Kubernetes with a lot of staple sets. We deal with customers' data, and we take that very, very seriously. So whenever we're talking about scale, we're usually talking about maintaining uptime and availability of these back-end systems, but we're also talking about the sheer number of regions that we offer our service in. So a little terminology. <laughs> um, the cluster autoscaler is typically called the CA. Um, I call it the CAS because sometimes when I hear people say I'm going to go rotate a CA, I just have like a minor cardiac infarction. I'm sure some of you folks know what I'm talking This guy's shaking his head. He knows what's going on. Yeah, it scares you, right? Uh, so I just call it the CAS. It makes explaining stuff to people so much easier. Uh, so if I say it and I sound wrong, um, I'm just weird. Uh, OKE, okay, if I drop that, that's our version of our, our Kubernetes environment. Um, same thing as like AKS, EKS, GKE, that kind of stuff. Um, and then node pools, uh, very similar to like AWS ASGs. Um, it's a way for us to templatize the different types of worker nodes that we're going to have in our cluster um, and give us a way to kind of facilitate that scale, that up and down. That's our, that's our interface to doing so. So um, today we are going to talk uh, about a few things. So first we are going to dive into what our patching requirements are. Then we are going to talk a little bit about a tool that we developed to automate our patching. And as we grew, we grew in a lot of, uh, so the scale that JMO was talking about, we grew very much into, so we expanded in a lot of regions. So that is the scale we are talking about. So we had to be present in a lot of regions. Um, so with it came a new set of problems which, re, which brought in a new set of requirements. Then we moved on to figure out, okay, how do we fix this automation how do we manage to automate all of our security patching at this scale? So we are going to then talk a little bit about the impact we had with this new solution. And then we are going to deep dive into how we implemented it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the requirements we had. So every month, we have a deadline to patch all of our machines with the latest security monthly image. So this image comes with the latest security fixes that we have to run all of our machines in to meet the compliance requirements. So all these worker nodes that we have in our clusters, they have an in-house tool that automatically page, uh, patches the machines. And we wanted to move into a world that would, be, that would automate all of our patching for us. So we wanted it to be simple so that it could be operated in disconnected regions, and we wanted it to be hands-off. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solution that we first had. Round one, fight. <laughs> so this is a mortal combat. So um, 
what we did was we actually created a tool that got deployed outside of the Kubernetes cluster. What this tool did was it would collect a list of all the nodes that we had in our clusters. And then it would go and sequentially patch all of them. Now, this was deployed as a privileged pod on the nodes, and it would run the in-house tool that we already have. So this, this tool would also follow the Kubernetes semantics of how you maintain a node, doing maintenance in a node. So it would first go drain the node and run the update. This update would automatically reboot the machine. So when the machine comes back up, it uncordons it, and all the parts that were pending would go back to the node. With this tool, though, what we had was it would take 25 minutes to patch one node, which during which time the parts running on the, on the node would be unavailable. So as I was talking about the scale, OCI grew very fast and got like spread very fast in many regions. So we did scale, but our deadlines did not scale, right? Like we had to go uh, do our patching within the fixed deadline. So deadlines were actually too close to comfort. So at times, the other problems that we saw with this tool was sometimes the nodes would not come back up. So it would just be stuck and be waiting for the node to come back on healthy because it would not be able to uncoordinate. So it would wait uh, on the stuck node, and we would have to go and check, oh, what's the status? We would go and look into the graphs and see, oh, this thing is stuck because the node did not come up. So with the scale that we grew in, we often started to get a lot more compute maintenance notification. So we would go get a notification from compute saying that, hey, this node, is, this node needs to be replaced, or it has to be rebooted. So we, run into, we ran into a lot of these kind of cases where we had to go periodically, time to time, update our uh, nodes like that. So one other problem was that with the compute maintenance that we were doing, if we rotated a node out, we, the node that came out, uh, that came up, would be on the old version. And then we had to go and patch it again. Time to time, we also had to deal with a lot of Kubernetes upgrades. Um, and with this scale, it became a challenge for us. So my friend James Satterfield and I, uh, we've been SREs for quite a while. We tend to sit down every once in a while and just kind of have one of those reflective moments, right? We ask a lot of whys. When we see something, we're like, why do we do this? Why do we put up with this? It's like 2023. We should do like something more modern. And at the same time, we also realize that trying to induce, introduce big changes can be scary. But we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, I might want to put new tires on my car, but I don't want to have to go get like an oval instead of a circle, right? I want to be able to use something that other people do. I want to be able to go and do things that if we go and have somebody join our team, that it's not just some internal tool that's kind of hard to reason through. And more importantly, James and I had actually done something like this in the past, but not really for security patching. But when we really thought, you know, kind of thought about it and sat back, we were like, wow, wouldn't this work here too? And that's where the cast comes in. One of the other things that we try to do here is, I think most folks have kind of adopted like a replace versus repair. Um, it's kind of tough to troubleshoot some issues sometimes, and you really don't want to have to keep maintaining these machines over and over and over again. We actually had machines with an age of like 768 days. They'd gone through two kubelet cert rotations. Uh, at that point in time, it's kind of like, okay, we should probably let this thing go off the greener pastures. The other big thing that we wanted to try to accomplish was, we're a big fan of Surge. We really want to try to favor bringing up something new before we touch something that's existing and dealing with customer traffic. Let's try to minimize the impact, not only to ourselves and our alarms and our alerting, but also to our customers. Kubernetes upgrades, um, I'm sure folks have gone through many of them at this point. Um, I don't know what the oldest Kubernetes runtime that somebody's run over here, but I'm in the single digits ones, you know, like 1.2, 1.3, something there. Uh, anybody remember pet sets? No? Yeah, this guy. Okay, minions. <laughs> remember? Yeah. Anyways, I've been doing Kubernetes for a while, and uh, upgrades are relatively easy if you can keep them going fast enough. And that's one of the issues we currently had. You know, that two-version bump was a bit of a problem. So 
these no maintenances that Israel talked about, they were coming up all the time, and we really should be able to handle this. If a compute notification comes in, why doesn't our system just like get rid of the note? Um, additionally, I think everybody has been trying to focus on cost, and we knew that we were over provisioned in several, several situations. We had several machines that kind of had like a, a little bit of room left. We really could use Kubernetes to bin pack a little bit better. We just needed our infrastructure to not be so rigid. And most importantly, we needed this to remain simple enough because in those disconnected regions where we physically cannot see or operate, we want to make sure that we are good providers to our customers there who help us maintain and operate our systems in those disconnected regions. So my buddy James and I uh, decided to write up a little doc and propose something. We called it Project Ectasis. Bonus points if anybody knows what that means. Um, but basically, this was the next stage of the fight. Round two, fight. Now we can leverage the cluster autoscaler for all that it's capable of. You know, the standard, it goes ahead and brings up a machine if you don't have enough places to run a pod, if you don't have enough resources defined on, a, on the existing infrastructure that's there. We're huge fans of PDBs. We think they're a great feature. And we emphasize that when engineers want to add new services to our fleet, please think about pod disruption budgets. We are going to have to shoot one of these services in the head, but let's maintain availability and consistency with what we're doing. These replacements of the fleet, um, it might be an OS image, but what if it's something else? What if I wanted to change the CPU architecture? What if I wanted to change the network that it's running on, like a CNI type? What if I wanted to change basically anything? Metadata about a node, we should be able to turn that into some sort of trigger. Kubernetes upgrades, that's definitely something we'd have to deal with as well. And most importantly, we needed this thing to parallelize because this sequential nature, when we really get up to par in some of our bigger regions, it was gonna kill us. And at most of all, I do want to say this, I always try to joke at, uh, when I talk about this with internal teams, uh, I want to just do like drinks on a beach, man. That's the kind of stuff that I want to run. I want to be able to just sit back and watch my systems run themselves. So when we did this, when we implemented it, we were kind of shocked at actually how fast it went. Um, we, using the Custer Autoscaler the way we did, we went from five days in our biggest regions with many hundreds of nodes. Um, we went down to a matter of hours. Uh, in some regions, it actually finishes before you could go make a cup of coffee. So the pod pending time is a huge thing for us. We no longer had to touch an existing service. We got to basically try it before you buy it with all of our new infrastructure. This also opened up room for us to basically go back and say, hey, we have an alarm that says if a machine's going to take a while to come up, maybe we could tighten that. Maybe we can actually get a little bit closer to that kind of real-time infrastructure workload that we were looking for. Okay, it's, I mean, we, we moved through, I don't know, 1.18 all the way to 1.25 and probably what, less than a month? <laughs> that was pretty crazy. Um, so, and the other thing is the adaptive infrastructure. By using the cluster autoscaler, we actually gained the ability to scale out as our services needed to scale themselves up, which means we could start doing something like HPA, Keta, all the fun stuff. The other thing was the migration. When we moved to this, we introduced a completely different infrastructure layout, but none of our services internally had to deal with it. We just changed our node selector. Nobody even knew that we moved to a completely different runtime. So, so the next big question was, how did we achieve this? So, we used a, so we were in a place where we wanted to go to a direction where we, where we adopted a lot of cloud native uh, practices. So, as Jamo mentioned earlier we were thinking about implementing cluster autoscaler. And we, we also actually used the concept of taints and tolerations. And we introduced a new system, a new way to version our hardware by using rotation hash. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the infrastructure layout that we had and how the rotation hash is integrated into our infrastructure. And we are talk, we're gonna talk about a little bit about the rotator pods. So these pods are basically deployments that we inject the rotation hash with. Then uh, we'll touch a little bit about how we use pre-stop hooks to make our service more resilient, since we are operating a lot of stateful sets. So, so what is the cluster autoscaler? Uh, there's three basic things that it does. Scale up, scale in, scale down. It's as simple as that. So, Israel put together a cool little animation here while I'll talk about it. So when we scale up, it's typically, I make a pod, I ask for it to be created, and if I don't have the resources to schedule it, the kube scheduler's like, man, I don't know what to do. 
Well, the cluster autoscaler is sitting there going like, hmm, I want every pod to have a home. So let me go and find the right place in my infrastructure to scale this up. Just curious, show of hands, who here has run the cluster autoscaler? Awesome. It's pretty simple. But there's beauty in that simplicity. Do you really have to overthink every problem? Like, the folks who were behind this, they put a lot of time and energy into this. So this scale-up mechanism that we use, just going to run through it real quick so you can see it. And it's going to go ahead and provision a new node whenever a pod can't be scheduled. Then it's going to get that it's going to get that pod ready, and then once it's ready, your pod is now running on it. Simple as that. So the scale down, this one's a little bit more fun. So first of all, when the cluster autoscaler wants to scale something down, typically you're going to deal with something called the min utilization percentage, um, which is going to say, how much utilization of this node do I make it eligible for me to get rid of it? Right? I think the default is what, 50%? I think that's right. What if you made it 100? What if every node in the cluster could be deleted at any point in time? Well, that's the question that we asked, and so we tried to do it that way. So when the cluster autoscaler wants to scale down a node, it's going to go ahead and look and say, hey, hypothetically, if I were to get rid of this node, can all the pods here go somewhere else? And if they can, it'll go ahead and start scheduling them somewhere else, utilizing evictions. Boom, checkbox number one. Got my PDBs in action. So after the cluster autoscaler goes through this routine, that node is going to end up being empty. That's the last one. Once you have an empty node, you really don't need to keep this thing around anymore. All right. Pretty slow slide. <laughs> we got to work on some animations. So cluster autoscaler configurations. Um, there are way more that I want to go over here. But the big ones that stand out to me, and I want to call it out, scan interval. As your clusters start to increase and the, and the complexity of your scheduling goes up, you really need to start looking at that scale interval. So far, we're at 10 in most of our regions, but I've had to start to lump and even monitor it to see if we need to go up to 20. One of the big key takeaways there is keep track of how long it takes your cluster autoscaler to run through your fleet and ask those what if questions. The bigger your clusters get, you need to pay attention to this feature. Secondly, new pod scale up. Um, how many folks have like done a deployment and maybe one of your pods has a slower than normal shutdown time, right? Something where it just doesn't go away as fast as you wish it did. Well, you have another pod that's going to come and fill on that node as soon as that guy goes away, maybe due to an anti-finity or some other resource constraint, right? Well, I don't want to have the cluster autoscaler just churning nodes, just burning our infrastructure, adding, removing, adding, removing, right? I really recommend this new pod scale-up delay. Now, we use a flag uh, at first when we did this, but they do support annotations, and I highly recommend that as well. So using an annotation, different pods have different characteristics for whether they trigger a scale-up or not. The balancing similar node groups is a concept that we used heavily here as well. Because of those staple sets, we were able to make sure that when we moved over to have, say, three node pools that looked all the same, we wanted to make sure that they each scaled up individually so we had good striping across availability zones, fault domains, that's a concept inside of OCI for single AD regions. So we wanted to definitely set that to true. But as Israel mentioned, we actually ended up using tolerations and taints to do a lot of this cool work. So you need to tell a cluster autoscaler, this taint, you don't need to worry about this one. This one should not be factored in when it comes up to scaling your nodes. Balancing ignore labels. This one is interesting because whenever you're getting an infrastructure that has labels already applied for you, they may not be part of the labels that are already defaulted and or you know, acceptable to the cluster autoscaler when it treats a group as balanceable or something that is of the same group or set. So make sure you take a look at those labels in order to set those up. Scale down utilization, one right here. Every node is always, is always eligible to be scaled down. And the reason we want that is because the simple, the simple rotation that we're going to do needs to be able to run on top of nodes that are perfectly bin packed by design. The next thing is the scale down on ready needed, or scale down on needed time, that one. Um, we turned this down because we actually got to the point where we trusted this thing so much, we kind of want it to run on like, like warp speed. So we started tuning all of these things down. So uh, the next thing we are going to talk about is the taints and tolerations. Um, I like pod affinity. It attracts pods to the nodes. So taints is the opposite. It basically ripples the pods from the nodes. 
So this demonstration here is a little bit, uh, that says a little bit about how tolerations and taints work. So if you can see, the green part is only going to uh, be scheduled onto the node which has a, which, for which the taint it tolerates, right? Like the green one. So we, we came up with a new concept. We called it, at, uh, called it as a rotation hash. So this rotation hash, we basically thought of it as why don't we try to version our infrastructure? Like we want to move from one, per, one version of infrastructure to another version of infrastructure. So every month, for example, we had to go through the OS patching cycle. And since the image would be different in every month, so that would be a component that told us that, hey, you need to change your, upgrade your infrastructure. So we came up with a couple of things, a couple of parts that we could use as versioning our infrastructure. So for example, the OS image, the Kubernetes version, for example, if you wanted to move from one Kubernetes version to the other one, this also required us to like rotate out the whole fleet. So we added it as a part of the rotation hash. Similarly, moving on from one architecture to another architecture. Similarly, from time to time, cloud in it and all that. So this is, a, this is a simple example on how we implemented the rotation hash as part of our monthly patching cycle. So every month since we have different OS image, you can see in line 28, uh, line 20, the image is October OS image. And it calculates a rotation hash. Uh, as you can see from the rotation hash parts, we just calculate a SHA out of it and we get a rotation hash out of it. And similarly, we do this, let's try to evaluate and compare it with the month of November. So in November, the OS image changes. And I would quickly show you the difference between these two uh, months. So on the top, you can see the rotation hash for October is different to what we have in November, but the only field that changed was the OS image part. And this basically helped us version our infrastructure and we applied it to our security patching. So I want to talk a little bit about pre-stop hooks. Um, running a staple set is kind of hard at some times. Like you, you have to deal with the Kubernetes knowing about the cluster state. Now, we hadn't gotten to the operator sec the section of our, of our workloads um, due to some unique constraints. But what we could do is we could utilize a lot of the Kubernetes tooling that's already built in place, such as pre-stop hooks. So what if we could run a script that actually would inform Kubernetes that we can't quite stop yet? Like, we're in a state where everything to you looks cool, but inside, I need a little cleanup, or I need to make sure some data is replicated first. That three-way replicated data store is one of the things that we use, and we notice that from time to time during certain failure scenarios that we might not want to have more than one node leave the cluster at a time. So these pre-stop hooks became mission critical to being able to maintain our uptime. The second thing you gotta take into account though is termination grace period. You gotta tell Kubernetes that it's gonna take a little bit for this pod to shut down and then what's unreasonable. So in some of our cases, we actually started to put this thing up towards six, seven, maybe eight hours because we had alarming that said, hey, if you have a pod that's stuck in terminating and you're in the middle of your pre-stop hook for a while, which is constantly emitting metrics, I should probably Get, alar get alarmed and page in somebody to take a look at what's going on. Something is atypical and I'd like to react appropriately. So basically, we're gonna try to put this all together. As Israel mentioned, we go ahead and we calculate this rotation hash. Now, this rotator pod that he mentioned too, that's just the application side of it, but the infrastructure side is really key and it's, it's governed by Terraform. And that was the other aspect of this. How can we do this without introducing new tools? And what's available to us? Like again, the, there's beauty in this simplicity. That SHA-1, SHA-1 aside, uh, is just a simple hash function that will able to tell us that things are changing. So we actually pass that to our nodes so that when they come up, they'll have an extra arg that says, hey, start up with this taint, which is gonna repel certain pods. So there's this rotator pod deployment. Well, hold on a second. How does our pod know about the infrastructure version that it should target? Again, we utilize Terraform. We have to use Terraform as part of our deployment mechanism. Well, why not just use a data source? So each one of our node pools that we have basically is also gonna get a sister or companion rotator pod. At the time of deploy, it says, 
what is the current infrastructure version that this node pool will spin up if it were to add a new node? Add that as part of the deployment and make sure that when it goes out, it causes that node, or that, excuse me, that pod to not go on any existing nodes. It forces the cluster autoscaler to get involved. So one of the other things here is the max surge. So I can sit here, we don't really care about the rotation pods, but we do get that max surge capability that we're looking for. I get to try it before I buy it. And we've all been there. I'm sure people have tried to make changes to their infrastructure. And then everything works in dev and then you try to bring it up and your just node doesn't join in time. Your node comes up with something unique. We have all been there. I'd really like to maintain not touching my existing software and this worked beautifully. One big aspect though is this progress deadline. So for those who are not familiar, a deployment will basically time out. The deployment controller will be like, man, this is taking too long, I'm gonna give up. We have to bump this up a little while and that's okay for us because this particular rotator pod is the only one that we put this on. Everyone else we alarm on if we can't get to that progress deadline in the, in the correct amount of time. Now, Helm is one of the ways that we deploy our apps. So just a simple, again, same tools we already use today, just a template variable, gets thrown as a toleration, and these rotator pods look for the exact match of this particular hash. That's what couples our infrastructure to this rotation. Again, super simple. What's also cool is all of our existing fleet is already ignoring that same rotation hash in terms of an application perspective. So we don't repel any of our other pods, just the rotators. So Israel's gonna run through a quick little demonstration of this, this deployment here. But imagine that this is also at the same time also flowing through the fleet and upgrading our infrastructure. We're using that max surge and we're gaining the ability to have new infrastructure come up that's vetted before we move forward. So to bring it all together, let's say we have two nodes here, right? And we see that for a particular node pool, all the nodes are tainted in yellow. Now, we are trying to do a rotator pod deployment. So currently, the rotator pod deployment is in V1. So as, the, as we move on to a new version of our infrastructure, let's say it's V2. So, our, so we, got, we get a new pod that is pending now, which cannot go on to any of the nodes because of the toleration it has, because it has a new toleration that is pending. So now the cluster autoscaler sees that, oh, this pod is pending, let's find it a home, and it brings up a new node. And now you see a new node that comes up with a rotation hash pink. Now the pod can actually go and settle in there. So once the pod gets settled in, the deployment progresses further up. So it removes one of the older version of the rotator pod. So now, as Jemo said earlier, the cluster autoscaler comes into action and it starts its second operation, the scale down operation. So the cluster autoscaler sees that there are a couple of nodes and let's try to figure out if these pods can live somewhere else. So it evaluates it and sees that these pods can be moved to another node. And since these pods can be moved to another node, I do not need this node anymore. So that node goes away and it is scaled on by the cluster autoscaler. So the cluster autoscaler does this for all of our nodes that, have, that are in the system. So it evaluates the previous node, this node, and it performs this operation in all the nodes. So I want to add a little bit more on that in closing. Most folks probably run the cluster autoscaler on a dedicated fleet of nodes outside of the cluster or at least outside the purview of its own ownership. We tested this heavily and as one of the core requirements that we had, we wanted to make sure that not just the nodes that cluster autoscaler is managing could be replaced. But what about the cluster autoscaler itself? Running those as a deployment with multiple replicas was, was key for us reaching that goal. At this point in time, there isn't a single node in any of our fleets that isn't governed by the cluster autoscaler or capable of being killed at any point in time. So this is our talk, and I wanted to thank you all for coming out. Um, really appreciate it, and really appreciate the support. It is also my first KubeCon as well, so thank you so much for your time. I really hope we get some questions too. Thank you. Thanks oh, for hey. the great presentation. So a question that I have is about the testing process that you had for this. Uh, um, I assume it's gonna be 
challenging to do that, and I would love to know a little bit about that. And also, um, another question that I had was about, uh, you mentioned about OKE. What would be different in um, your deployment process if you wanted to um, do everything in native uh, Kubernetes? Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's a great question. So two that I heard there. Um, first of all, the testing process. Um, because we didn't actually introduce any new componentry to the system, it wasn't that we needed to go through extensive validation of existing or new tools. All of our existing tools, basically we could use the same workflows. But what we did start doing is we made sure that this thing runs all the time. In several of our testing environments, we're constantly running just a little pod, think of it like a cron job, that's going through and changing these tolerations. So one, one aspect of the, the slide you might have missed is we use something called no execute on that toleration, which means that when you have a mismatch, we kick off that rotator pod. So that means that as soon as it gets touched, and for say, for example, we just touch it and say, replace me, we start the process. So we're constantly running this thing through its paces, looking for any regressions that introduce into the system. We have regions that are being built tens, hundreds, if not faster, times a day. So secondly, what makes this unique about OCI, or is it is, let me rephrase that question, is there a way to use this in any other cloud? And the answer is yes. So because we're using just simple Terraform, which most people are using today in order to manage their infrastructure, you have access to the same hashing functions. You have access to that same concept. If you really think about it, there's probably a way that you look at your infrastructure today and say, oh, there's this class of nodes for these, and there's this class of nodes for these. Think about what those rotation parts mean to you. They're unique to us, and we're constantly adding them. The other day, I think we added, what, three or four new things for node labels and all sorts of stuff. Like, it's actually pretty simple, and that's where the beauty of this is, and that's why we wanted to share it. You should, be you should be able to look at your infrastructure and really break it down into those small component parts that may change from time to time. Yeah, I'd like to add, like, we got a lot of uh, side um, additional benefits with this. So when we had the system in place, it was easier for us to add the rotation hash parts like we talked about. Like, if we wanted to move our fleet from one architecture machine to another architecture machine, we could do it with one deployment, like, and it would be done. Like, all of your fleet would be just migrated from one infrastructure to another infrastructure. And it would do it, like, the max search. And like JMO said, very importantly for stateful sets, you would get a machine first, and then your, it will not touch your stateful set before you get a new machine. That's, that's very important. Yeah. No. Great question, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Man. Yeah, I'm curious about... Uh your work organization there. It sounds like you guys are the, you know, innovators, the creative thinkers, right? That you're coming up with new, new ways of doing things. How, yeah. how many people are on the team that runs this infrastructure, and and what kind of support do you have at the, like, system administrator? I mean, obviously you have a lot. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like I work in an academic setting where okay. I kind of wear all those hats, and yep. it can be a little bit difficult to have enough time to do to do all those things. So, like, how much of your time do you get to devote to this innovation and how much do you just have to do the grunt work of watching pods spin up and spin down? Great question. So, um, as Israel mentioned back in the talk, we used to have folks who would sit here and have to watch graphs as we would rotate our fleet with that manual tool 24 seven. We had to have somebody there. If it was off hours and somebody wanted to go out to eat or something, they'd have to turn off the rotation. We'd have to slow down. We'd lose time, right? When you have a system like this, and hopefully you have things like Prometheus and Alert Manager, various other alarms that are available, you can get notified if it gets stuck. And the concept of getting stuck, at least in this particular case, is typically in the situation of, I've run out of compute. I got some weird transient error from you know, my cloud provider that says, pool's closed, man. Like, that's basically the things that have held us up. But at the most, excuse me, for the most part, we don't actually have to watch this anymore. Tune your alarms would be my biggest thing. You probably have alarms given the way that you're currently thinking about your infrastructure today. Once you truly kind of break yourself of that existing model, step back and say, what if? You can really find out that three minutes is your average spin up time. Alarm yourself in five. You know, tailor that closer down to A, your workload, and B, your runtime. Um, as far as the hats, um, I wear many of them, mostly my favorite. Um, but the, the real thing is like, we're all over the place. We don't have that kind of dev and ops mindset. 
So we're constantly having the ability to say, hey, I'm currently write, writing software right now that manages my infrastructure one way or manages my this part of my application another way. And we have that kind of luxury where we're at to be able to take a step back and kind of think of things from a different lens. And I think that's actually one of the things that uh, I really enjoyed working with Israel on is, uh, I don't know if you, if you saw it in our opening slides, but uh, he's a software engineer and I am not a software engineer. Um, <laughs> so I hope that helps your question. It's good, cool, thank you so much. Um, we don't have to wrap up now, but we are happy to take questions on the uh, oh, nearby yeah. stage. Did you have and one more, man? I think we got enough time for one more. Yeah. yeah. Oh, excuse me, I, I couldn't hear you, mate. Uh, I just had a question about the taints and tolerations. Yes. So I was a little confused. So when you boot up that new node group, right, you yeah. have a taint with yes. the new hash. Yes. And that first pod, right, it has a toleration for that new hash, mm -hmm. and therefore the, the, the autoscaler can then boot up that new node. Yep. But the old workloads, they don't have the toleration for that new taint, right? How do you get that? Great question. So uh, tolerations can be based on key and value, or they can be explicitly just key. And there's also a third one, which is the, the type, whether it's be like no execute, prefer no execute, right? Or, you know, no schedule, stuff like that. Um, so we specifically, for all of our apps, they already trust that rotation key, and they're willing to run on it regardless of the version. That's the magic. Remove that value field from your definition of tolerations, and now you just care about whether the, it's like a, it's like a three-part tuple. Now you only care about two of them, the ones that are always static. I see, so in combination with the setting, the cluster here, where you have like 100% utilization. Yes. It, 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 it fix and attracts to the new. Node. Yes, so the cluster autoscaler, um, I might have glossed over it a little bit. Cluster autoscaler says, can I hypothetically move all pods on this node? Then I'm eligible for scale down. If one of them can't go away, your new nodes never leave you because that new pod can't live on your old infrastructure. It doesn't trust that hash. Gotcha. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I it's, so. I mean, it, it's, it's so simple, but it actually worked remarkably well for us. Great question, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again, folks. Uh, before people go, I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, mention this. Um, we actually have a lot of swag. For everybody who's interested at the talk, uh, some helpers over there are going to be handing out little cards. Um, stop by the Oracle booth upstairs, and you're going to be able to get some you know, t-shirts and all that kind of cool stuff for attending our talk. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.